Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last of Europe, in which we're going to explore the Christian Republic of Samaria. Horrified by Daddy Tabby's heretical version of Orthodox Christianity, the surviving clergy of Western Russia has flocked to Samara, <coughs> which was seized by the general uprising of the populace upon the Regency's collapse. Though initially rejecting power, the people made their wishes clear. Every other ideology has failed Russia. In the end, in the absence of anyone better, they have turned once more to God, or in the case of the secularists, to the last authority that might retrain some competence and moral backbone, or retain it. Uh, a semi-theocratic republic has thus been declared, with a mixture of clergy and laity, or laity, making up the government, bureaucracy, and officer corps. <clears throat> Very cool, my friends. Very nice. We're led by Sergei Izke Izvikov. Cool. Genesis. Samara lay well within the grasp of the regent. An apathy infected every rotten crevice therein. The motted, or moted, mottled apartment complexes gazed over the people eking out an existence, left to buckle and break under Tabaretsky. Russia found itself content with its quiet despair, and found no reason to break out of it. The Stromoviki made sure to contain that apathy, and people knew not to break from it. Russia waited. With every day spent waiting for change, Russia's will decayed. Its spirit abolished in favor of heresy. Such was the fate of the people of Samara, victims to apathy, soldiers of sloth. Russian spirit was born anew, and in a sense it repeated. When clergymen gave sermons to the people, the people listened. The word of the Lord had returned to Russia, expunged too long by insanity. What, what few Catholics of Russia flocked to the city, apathy began its own death, its inevitable supernova, showering the city in determination. When the people took up arms in the name of liberation, apathy's death was ensured, but the city was showered in fire and lead. Any word of the ROA, M Metropolitan Pyman shouted to nobody in particular, as he stood beside a field hospital, consisting of those in Samara who knew to hide their talents. Everyone working on a burned victim or shrapnel-hidden partisan shouted as a gunfire crackling throughout the main strip had yet to dissipate. <clears throat> the Vyatkin officers and clergy members surrounding him made up of what effectively amounted to an escort, as vengeful Stromoviki prowled the alleyways and windows, prompting the guard to bring them bring with them a dozen AT grenades down the street. A flare's light lit up a smoke screen, occasionally glowing with the harsh streaks of gunfire and a figure growing clear from the, out of the smoke, bearing a bandage armed, half sprinting past the mortar teams taking position along the sides of the street. By the time he got to the escort, his arm had grown soaked through with blood and he was panting like a beaten dog. Your Excellency, he took in a deep breath and continued, the ROA remnant armies have been finishing off the remaining Regency forces in the north of the city. He gestured towards the roof of an office where off his block, on the verge of collapsing with his own good hand, as a thump of mortars flew over it. And we have reports of clergy arming slaves in Ninzi and Novgorod. That's all we know. Now, if you'll excuse me, the officer nearly fell into one of the cots lining the sidewalk. I'm dying. We have national spirit cell. Begin the waste. Ooh, we make a lot of babies, don't we? That's a lot of monthly population. I like that a lot. And we have blessed irrigation. Just five world stamps. That's not great, but it is what it is. Of course, we have salted earth. <coughs> Exodus. Bad word me. How were there so many people still in Russia? Frederick looked to his desk, and I felt like he was going to be sick. Coffee ran out long ago, and his collection of tea bags now rotting in his waistband was allowing for a disgusting manifestation of his work ethic to take shape within the confinement of his trivial workspace outside. Shouting matches had been taking place all day and night, day and night, and day and night, concerning about what went where and how much could be spared. From the sounds of it, nothing. From the looks of it, too. Foodstuff hadn't been exactly plentiful prior to the takeover, but now they simply did not exist. So had his 20 manila folders told him anyways. Feeling around <clears throat> his pockets, Frederick pulled out his last uh, cigarette, rolling it around in his fingers. He could tell the filter was liable to snap poor manufacturing skills, the cost of half your skilled workers being turned to bricklayers of corpses. The image of the uprising flashed to Frederick's mind, prompting him to take out his matchbox. Now that was better. He could really think. Right. The problem was a total lack of infrastructure for essentials, and everyone was striving from the side of the dawn to Ninzi Novgorod. If only everyone just knew how bad things were in this gosh darn city. The tobacco and tea had mixed together into a vomit-inducing smell, certainly not helped by the figures sitting on the paper behind Frederick, as he sat in front of the desk, <clears throat> and watched the smoke dissipate as a ceiling fan chopped it into pieces. This wasn't enough. Walking out the door, he left it open half to air out the diseased waste bin, half to show his superiors he hadn't been sleeping, as if the smell wasn't enough of an indicator. 
Stepping outside, the streets of Samara weren't, ex weren't actually crowded, not by his definition, but the signs of a city fit for starvation were everywhere. He let out a puff of smoke and stepped down from his office steps with an irrelevant urgency as reports he'd left unfinished in his office would need much more than the seconds he'd saved. As he walked, he checked his surroundings. He walked past the couple, thin as his pencils and half as strong. He looked at them as he passed, half expecting themselves to be shot by him. The Russian luck, they call it. The figures show there will be another few thousand in Samara by tomorrow. This was going to be bad. One party state pluralism? Wait, pluralism? Hmm, okay. No voting? Ah, and our theocratic state, no one gets to vote. And we have segregated regiments. Now let's go and grab some of this for the nation. Oh, Leviticus. Are we ready, Grandmaster Pyman? Looked up from the paper, sitting between himself and the small crowd. Vladimir Bayarsky, the last of the ROA generals, half asleep, gestured to the paper script in front of the both of them. The hall the meeting was taking place in was a relic of Tabriski's exploits, redecorated to abolish the vile memories of the unspeakably horrific character. The mural to the Tsarevich, a symbol of the horrific actions taken in his name, was repainted with the dull yellows and reds into a scene of the heavens. Although with the scheme adorning the wall, it was hard to disassociate, or it was hard to associate, the scene with anything but the land below their feet. The swastikas hanging from the walls were burnt, and the candles were lit in the name of a new age. The Grand Master looked to his surrounding accomplices, a half dozen civilian governors and generals. The general, all standing around each other in equal stoic hope and total impatience. This little ceremony was a luxury that they could hardly afford, and yet here they were, standing around the Republic's soon-to-be constitution. The right to vote was first, an obvious pick since authority was established in Samara. The right to pray was, again, inherent. The power to conscript any one citizen into the armed forces was an unpopular decree, but still one many saw as essential. <clears throat> So the list went, and by the name, and by the time the last rights and responsibilities were ushered, or uttered, all signed the piece of paper along the dotted lines and returned to their duties. How could they not, when crime and homelessness were skyrocketing? The civilians returned to their offices to deal, to direct where aid was to go, while General Bayersky returned to his duties of maintaining the fledgling National Army. Good Master Pyman would not be so sudden to leave, walking up and down the darkened temple. Pyman pondered whether this constitution would make any kind of difference. With the refugees pouring into Samara, Catholic or not, they'd be proving a def deficit upon the nation as a whole. The situation could certainly be fixed with time, though that was something the Republic did not have. The Republic, or the Republic's foundations, shake. Hold on. I thought we got rid of the no voting thing. I thought people could vote. Maybe. Well, I guess we lied. We were lied to. Oh. Ooh. More equipment? Sure, why not? We shall grab you more equipment. With By more equipment, we mean trucks. Cool. Oh, look. State oppression? Cool. Numbers. Another day, another dozen greasy manila folders to sort through. It was days like this that kept Metropolitan Pyman cooped up in his musty office, trapped with a stale coffee, the vapor once surrounding it, long since dulled into a lukewarm haze. Taking a pause to collect himself, Pyman looked to his hands and put his down his pen. Laying out a relief, he pushed his maroon leather seat away from his beaten oak table and looked to the brass knobs of the drawers to his desk, filled with sex paper, <clears throat> denoting one piece of information after another. His office was a bureaucratic highway into the future. A metropolitan pieman knew just how bleak it looked. All that awaited to complete his understanding of the Republic was to review its first census. His door was heaved open, and the metropolitan side, here it was, Pyman could already feel it off of the poor sap handing it over to him. This <clears throat> was a census. It was a collection of seven different sheets of paper, the topmost one scarred by a coffee stain. He held, held together by a flimsy paperclip, but it was a miracle the report hadn't fallen apart in his hands. Quickly scanning the front page, he felt a sensation of sweat and grime, probably, from the ever-stressed accountant and bean counters handing things over to someone who knew about as much on where that report was supposed to go as anyone else. Metropolitan Pyman couldn't keep fooling himself as many details as he tried to make note of. He couldn't erase that feeling in the back of his head that he needed to just read the paper. He refocused his eyes over the ink and read. But well, the age her was not precisely describable, only really identifiable, through what it must be doing to the office therein. Crackling of wood could definitely be, ma could be made out, as could the splinters creeping under the door. <clears throat> a wailing was equally audible, if now withering into a subdued whimper. After ten minutes of the charade, the door was finally pushed open by the Metropolitan, now looking to be disheveled beyond what any of the young accountants had ever seen in their entire lives. He had tears flowing down his face and scanned over his lock. He was going to give a speech. <clears throat> oh boy, that's not good news. Let's see, academic base, research facilities, uh, army professionalism and industrial expertise are all going up, even though industrial equipment and agriculture are stagnant and poverty is getting worse. But Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, huh? They were lined up like bottles on a fence as though it was target practice. And Metropolitan Pyman 
almost wish that it were the case, as from his sight overlooking the sprawling city square, packed with citizens, however, the only soldiers in sight were those keeping the jeering crowds back from the spies bound and gagged atop the stage, four nooses staring at them from across the unsteady planks. All four of them had varying severity of gashes along their faces, and rag clothing was nearly ubiquitous. As closely as they resembled refugees, they were <coughs> Sturmoviki. The crewman on the far left, wearing a dulled scarf and shoddy thin coat, had his face broken like shattered glass. The thinner second thug from the left apparently surrendered at the first opportunity and begged all the way to Samar for food. If only knew how bad things have gotten in the city. The traitor to the middle right seemed to yell at the hungry man, not that it could be heard over the shouting of the enraged crowds. According to his captors, Pyman had heard the madman wore a combat vest before it was seized from him, leaving him with nothing but his slacks and a green jacket. Judging from the dozen or so guns seized from his apartment, he was ready to take on the entirety of the National Army. Finally, the last man seemed as though he'd be dead in a minute anyway. On the stage, he wore a heavy trench coat and seemed nauseous while staring at the noose, and had sick the complexion of someone who was about to vomit bile across himself, judging from his clothing, already had. As the guards lifted the degenerate terrace to their nooses, <clears throat> the jeering from the crowd, the pushing and shoving grew so intense that it seemed like a riot would break out. Then the stage groaned, and with an uneasy creak, it crashed to the ground. The guards fell over or found themselves trapped beneath the boards. The mob climbed over the wreck and pulled out the bodies of the bloodied thugs. Then the mob tore them limb from limb. The Metropolitan watched and felt an urge to act to say, This is wrong. He neglected the thought, though, and I like this Christian Republic of Samara. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.